Dr. Furman created the Nutritarian Diet. He's the one who first coined that word, Nutritarian, an eating plan that incorporates the latest advances in nutritional science. His food scoring system measures the relative nutrient density of common foods and has directed millions of consumers to eat in an anti-cancer diet style. For over a quarter of a century, Dr. Furman has shown it's possible to achieve sustainable weight loss, reverse heart disease, diabetes, and many other illnesses using smart nutrition. In his medical practice, he continues to bring this life-saving message to hundreds of thousands of people all around the world. Please, if we could get to our feet and give Dr. Joel Furman a Longevity Now conference welcome. Dr. Joel Furman. Thanks so much. Well, I'm excited to be here and see all of you. And I have some, you know, wonderful news to tell you. We can all live to be 100. Without cancer, without strokes or dementia, without heart disease, nutritional science has made radical advances in the last few decades. We can have the healthiest population ever possible in human history. This is an unprecedented unprecedented opportunity in human history for us to take advantage of these modern advances. So how many people out there want never to have a heart attack or a stroke, never to get demented, not to get cancer, don't raise your hand yet, but are willing to do what it takes to achieve those optimal ideals and promises, willing to do what it takes. And before you raise your hand, that means you have to earn a normal blood pressure without medication, a normal blood glucose without drugs, a normal cholesterol without medication, and you have to achieve an optimal body weight at the same time. You have to do what it takes to make those achievements without taking drugs to cover them up. The more medications you're on, the more risk you are of having cancer or heart attack actually happen. So now, how many people are willing to do that to achieve optimal health? All right. You guys are right up my alley. You know, because let me ask you a question. Before we get started with this lecture, we have a really exciting presentation plan. Before we get started, I want to ask you a question. How many people here know somebody in their family, in their family who's been stabbed by a knife? Raise your hand. Three people. How about shot by a bullet in their torso? Or the, raise your hand. Four people. I've got the thousand that are here. Not bad. All right, now, let me ask you another question. How many people do you know have either had a heart attack or gotten cancer or a stroke, raise your hand. Like 500 people raised their hand. That's a neighborhood you shouldn't want to live in. Get away from there, get out of there. Dangerous. I'm gonna give you superpowers today. You know what I mean by superpowers? Here's a superpower I'm gonna give you. Really, this is serious stuff. What good are superpowers to fly through the air or shoot lightning bolts out of your eyes or to melt steel with your bare hands or whatever you could do if we're not being invaded by aliens and other superpowered creatures aren't fighting us? Those superpowers aren't even worth anything. Here's the superpowers that really are valuable to your life. If you really take this information to heart, I'm going to give you the power to protect yourself from the diseases that plague other Americans, to not have heart attacks, strokes, dementia, and cancer and to put the oxygen mask on yourself first and to be able to articulate this information clearly to influence others to save their lives. I'm gonna give you the superpower to have love and kindness and heal and help other people and save them from undergoing a tragic um, consequence, putting people in nursing homes after strokes and dementia, ruining families and destroying people and taking away their parents. And we have the most growing industry in America today is putting people in nursing homes with strokes under the age of 60 now. In the fast food desert areas of this country where produce is not available, we have seven times the incidence of strokes before age 45 in those areas. So what I'm saying to you today is that this is information that's critical for all, all Americans. And I'm glad you're here learning this with me. I'm glad we're gonna go through these basic principles to give you a better understanding so you can protect your own life and help me spread this information to save other lives. Do you got it now what I'm here for? Yeah. All right, it's gonna empower you. Thank you. 
So you ready to get started? Okay, let's get started then. Boom. Food gives us two types of nutrients. The first nutrient in food are macronutrients. The word macro means large, and these macronutrients contain calories. They're fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And here's the thing. The more calories you eat in life, the shorter your lifespan. Americans eat too much fat, they eat too much protein, they eat too much carbohydrate. Now, the only thing ever been proven in the history of science to radically extend lifespan of all species of animals, including primates and humans, only one thing's ever been proven over and over again, held up to be accurate and true in every study ever tested. And that is, and I'm going to repeat this a few times in this presentation, so you're going to get this. And that is moderate caloric restriction in an environment of micronutrient excellence. That means micronutrients do not contain calories. They're vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and antioxidants. That means if you want to slow the aging process and be 80 years old with the body of a 60-year-old and have your mind and not age your brain and have your full mental faculties through life and you want to push the envelope of human longevity to 100 or beyond, you have to be very careful to meet your micronutrient needs and not, ex not take in excessive amounts of calories. Now, by the way, if you have micronutrient excellence, here's the kicker. It suppresses the appetite. It makes you not want to overeat. Whereas if you have what's ubiquitously across America, mild, moderate to, sev to severe micronutrient deficiencies, it drives emotional overeating, food cravings, excessive calorie consumption, and you can't stop being an overeating machine. So what percent of Americans are overweight, would you say? Somebody yell out a guess. 70%, 70 you say, some of you say. Pretty good guess. But you see, the health authorities told you that. It's not true because they use a BMI of 25, above 25 is the demarcation line to differentiate a person of normal weight to be overweight. Whereas all long-lived societies around the world, all people who have the most centenarians, all have BMIs 23 and below, not 25 and below. If we use 23 as the demarcation line, not 25, then we classify 89% of Americans as overweight, not 70%. Did you got that now? Okay, now let's look at that 11% that are so-called normal weight. Because 9% out of those 11 are alcoholics, cigarette smokers, have autoimmune conditions, digestive disorders, occult cancers, depression, or other mental disease, or, or some other serious illnesses keeping them thin. Did you follow that? It's less than 2% of Americans are at their normal body weight because they eat healthy and exercise regularly. If you're healthy, and you're eating anything like other Americans eat, you're supposed to be overweight, and if you're not, you're sick. Any study looking at the normal weight people in America are going to find the sickest populations in America are normal weights. The only way to achieve an optimal weight and keep it there for the rest of your life is by eating healthy food because then you instinctually desire the right amount of calories. So I'm going to start out by giving you an example here of what... This is such a basic principle to understand human longevity. Isn't this conference called Longevity Now or something like that? So if that's the name of the conference, then shouldn't the participants know the most important, critical, basic, foundational science about human longevity? Okay? Right? Let's go over that. So I have this buffet in the front of the room here where you're going to take your plates, you're going to get, fill them up with food, and we're going to track how much calories you take into your food. Except when you make a line here to get up to the front of the room to eat, I'm going to give you an apple while you're waiting in line to get your food. And you know what's going to happen? I'm going to have a bunch of scientists measure how much you took on your plate and how much you ate till you were comfortably fed. And you'll find out that those people who ate the apple coming up to eat the food will have eaten 65 calories less because they accommodated the 65 calories from that apple, which filled them up with fiber and nutrients, so they chose 65 calories on the average less when they went down to eat their food. Do you got that? Okay. But the problem was now on this line of people, while they were waiting to get their food, we gave them a tablespoon of olive oil. And a tablespoon of olive oil at 120 calories has no significant micronutrient load and no really fiber in there. So when they came up to get their calories, it didn't turn down their apostat like the apple did. So when the people who were waiting in line got the 101 tablespoon of olive oil at 120 calories per tablespoon, when they came up here and ate their food and took them and their plates were weighed, and they saw how much they ate, 
they ate 120 calories in addition, thus overeating some calories in their meal compared to the people with the apple. But not only that, what if I, instead of giving them the olive oil in line, what if I poured the olive oil on the food, right, mixed it in? Then what would happen? You see, since olive oil doesn't turn on the apostat, there's no fiber and no senses, no signals to the brain that gets digested and absorbed so rapidly into the bloodstream. You don't burn it for energy, you store it as fat. So the people coming up here, if they mixed it in the food, would have found out that they not only get the extra 120 calories from the olive oil, but they also ate more food, and they wound up taking in a total of 220 calories more on the average than if they hadn't taken in the oil. You see, eating a diet with a high micronutrient density is all about eating foods that suppress the appetite and roll, and roll down the apostat. You see, the more empty calories you take in, the more you're diluting the micronutrient density of your diet. The formula that represents the first principle of a nutritarian diet is the most important principle that governs your lifespan and your healthy life expectancy. If you want to push 100 years old, you have to have a diet that has a high nutrient per calorie density. That means the foods you chose, choose to eat have to have a high amount of micronutrients per macronutrients, a high amount of micronutrients per caloric buck. Anybody help me out here? Anybody tell me what I just told you over the last five minutes? Can anybody tell me the first principle of a nutritarian diet? The principle that governs human lifespan and longevity. What is it? Can you articulate it in your own words, represented by this equation, H equals N over C? Nutrient-dense foods eat more nutrient-dense foods, creates long life. Right. I'll say it in my terms, okay, that... In order to maximally push the envelope of human nutrition, you have to eat a diet that's moderately caloric restriction in an environment of micronutrient excellence. You guys getting that now? I want to make it clear. That's why I'm repeating myself. That means the more foods you eat that are high in nutrients, like kale and broccoli and, and, and wild blueberries and, and, you know, and, and, um, and onions and scallions, the more you eat foods that are high in nutrients, the longer you live, and the more you eat foods that contain no nutrients and just give you empty calories, the shorter your lifespan. A perfect prototype of a food that's concentrated calories with no significant nutrients are oil. Now let's say, for example, use my, before I go on to this lecture, use my body as an example. Because I'm about 10 per, 9 or 10 percent body fat, I'm in my mid-60s. And, and let's just think about this for a minute. What if we had a, a calorimeter machine and a computer that figured out how many calories I need each day to maintain this exact weight where I've been for the last 65 years? We know, well, oh, no, I wasn't this weight when I was a kid. Only this weight for about 50 years, right? Okay, so let's say how many calories I need to maintain my perfect weight. Let's just say, for example, it may not be right, but let's just pull a number out of the air. 1,600 calories a day I need to maintain my perfect weight. Now, what if I just eat 625 calories a day on the average instead of 1,600, I eat 1,625. What happens to me? Overshoot my needs by 25 calories a day. Well, 25 extra calories a day times 365 calories a year comes out to three pounds a year I'm going to put on my body. Three pounds a year over 10 years, that's 30 pounds of weight. Over 10 more years, that's 15 years off my lifespan from 25 calories a day too much. Just a little bit extra calories a day too much shortens your lifespan and makes you not able to achieve longevity now. Now what, on the other hand, I undershot my, cal undershot my calorie calculations, and instead of eating 1,600 calories a day, I eat 1,550. I just eat 50 calories less, 50 to 100 calories less each day over my, what you've det scientists determined my metabolic rate requires to maintain my perfect lean body mass. Then what happens to me? Do I waste away to nothing? Do my bones get weak? Do I become anorexic? Do I shrink? What happens? Somebody's yelling out there, extend your life. How do you know that? How, did you listen to this lecture before? Thank you for the right answer, but here's what happens. What, hap what happens is you don't lose weight at all. Your body maintains its weight without getting too thin because I'm already at my ideal thinnest weight. I'm already, my, my stomach is already ripped. 
I already have that six pack. I'm already less than 10% body fat. I'm already exercising and I'm muscular. I'm not going to lose more weight because there's nothing to lose. Once I'm at my ideal weight, I'm not going to lose any further. So what my body's going to do now, so it doesn't prevent, so prevent me from losing weight, it'll slow down my metabolic rate by lowering the respiratory quotient. I won't lose as much calories through breathing. And it'll lower my body temperature a bit. So I will be a little, my hands and feet may be colder in the wintertime. I have to wear gloves when I'm skiing. Maybe I'm wearing mittens instead of gloves. But I can withstand the heat better in the summertime. I could, and my thyroid will shoot, will drop a little bit. My body will make these numerous modifications to slow down my metabolism so I won't get too thin. And thin. And in the process of slowing down my metabolism, I'm going to stop aging as rapidly. Slowing the metabolism is the equivalent of slowing the aging process. Speeding up the metabolism is the equivalent of speeding up the rate at which you're aging. Are you getting this so far? So when I moderately slow down my metabolism, what happens is my bones and muscles change. So the osteoclasts and osteoplasts building and breaking down bone don't have so much turnover, so it maintains my bone strength with aging, so I don't develop osteoporosis and, and sarcopenia. I don't lose the muscle and bones as I age. I keep my youthful strength and vitality because, I'm, because my metabolic rate is slightly slow. Are you following this right now? The monkeys that are fed a little less at, at 40 years old have the bodies of 16-year-old monkeys. The point is, though, how do, we, how do we comfortably restrict calories? Isn't that uncomfortable eating 50 calories less? The answer is no. I'm going to show you how you're going to eat as much food as you want, eat the most delicious diet you could possibly eat, eating until you're really satisfied, and still undershoot your metabolic rate to slow the aging process. Because, you know, most Americans, what they're doing is they think they're looking for some gimmick, some trick, some hook, some fad. They can speed up the metabolic rate so they can eat more food and not get fat. Aren't they? But the real... Right? But what we really want to do is slow down the metabolic rate so we can eat less food and not get too thin. It's completely the opposite. Longevity is the, the opposite of what people think. You guys are learning something different than most people are reading these magazines and internet articles and hearing these speakers spewing out nonsense, giving them all the opposite information of what you need to extend your longevity. You following me? You coming along for the ride? Let's move on then, okay? I think you got the first point. The standard American diet often called the SAD, I don't call it that, I call it the DAD, the DAD diet, the deadly American diet. It's more than 50% of calories from processed foods, junk, franken foods that have no nutrients in them. They're just taking in empty calories. Every bite of that bagel, that pizza, that croissant, that cheese doodle, that, uh, that you know, bread, pasta, salad oil, mayonnaise, donuts, cookies, crackers, rice cakes, breakfast, breakfast, chips, soft drinks, candy, anything you're eating, these calories with no nutrients. Every you take a bite of that, it's shortening your lifespan. Every bite, junk. And then Americans eat about 32% of calories from animal products. And right now I'm telling you that a piece of chicken is just like a bagel. And the reason I'm telling you a piece of chicken is like a bagel because neither one has a significant micronutrient load. In other words, there's no phytochemicals and antioxidants in the bagel and there's none in the piece of chicken either. The animal products do not contain the anti-cancer phytochemicals and antioxidants that extend human lifespan, and neither do the processed foods, and that's what Americans consume. And then we eat so-called about 10% of calories from produce, but that's not 10% because they count ketchup and french fries and chips and all the junk vegetables they put in there. They're not talking about raw, moderately cooked, you know, vegetable bean soups and, and salads. They're counting every kind of junk vegetable. It's closer to 5% of natural foods that we're eating properly cooked natural foods that Americans are eating, which is way too, too long. We're living in a fast food nation. And this fast food nation is destructive to our survival of our species. Let me go over this for a minute. See, fast food is not just what you buy in a fast food restaurant. It's things that can be accessed quickly, opened and eaten right away. The calories are absorbed very rapidly into your bloodstream. And it contains synthetic ingredients, not a significant micronutrient load, high in sugar and salt, and it usually drives overeating behavior. It drives you to want to eat more. 
And the health outcomes from fast foods are astounding, what it does to the body, how much it shortens and increases death. Ten people who eat fast food regularly have ten times the risk of heart attack and stroke compared to people who eat none. French fries and cancer. When you eat fried foods in a fast food restaurant, you're eating something cooked in oil. It's been heated in oil half the day, over and over again, causing rancid compounds and free radicals. It's carcinogenic oil. You know the link? There's a study that shows that women who eat French fries one day a week, that's moderation, right? One day a week, that's it. Increased risk of breast cancer by 26%. One day a week. Moderate consumption. And you know what? The diet you eat when you're pregnant is not the only way to damage your child because it's what you eat years before you even conceive that baby can damage the child as well. And the number one cause of death in children today, other than accidents, is acute blastocytic leukemia caused by the lack of consumption of green vegetables in the diet years before a conception occurs and by the consumption of processed foods, fast foods, and luncheon meats like bacon and hot dogs and pastrami and causing cancer in our children being the leading cause of death. Those eggs that cause, that cause your children live in there, living in your whole life in your body. When you eat bad as a child, you're damaging your future offspring. What I'm saying here is that we damage our genes when we don't eat a healthy life. So we're not just damaging our own life, when your mother is bringing you a donut to your soccer game, she's not just causing cancer in you, she's causing cancer in your unborn child at the same time. Did you follow that? And these fast foods are linked to depression, violence, mental illness, drug addiction, and illegal drug use, and half the people in federal prisons today are there because of nonviolent drug-related offenses. And who's talking about the, linking, the link between these frankenfoods and mental illness and causing people to become depressed and psychotic and kill and use drugs and the link between fast foods and drug addiction, right? Sugar is the gateway drug. You start out eating the candy and soon they want alcohol and then they want more drugs to get more brain stimulation because the sugar and the fast foods made their brain dopamine insensitive and now they go after more and more stimulation for the brain. This is dangerous stuff that we're doing in America. You have to be crazy to eat fast food and junk food and candy and to feed your children that stuff. It's addiction, addictive. Now, what if you live in a food desert? What if you live in the downtown Detroit, Chicago, uh, Oakland, you know, these areas where they have lack of supermarkets and produce, a lot of convenience stores, liquor stores, convenience stores, fast food restaurants, and you eat mostly fast food in your diet, high amounts, and you become obese and diabetic from eating that food. How many years of life do you think those people live, lost? Shocking, right? Shocking. Science is a term. If you're an overweight diabetic living in a fast food desert, you've lost, on the average, 45 years of potential life. That is a genocide. That is dangerous. That is dangerous. That is bad stuff. And you know what? It's a form of bigotry and racism as well. Because you know what you learn in medical school? You learn black Americans have high rates of diabetes, prostate cancer, breast cancer, more strokes at younger ages, as if their race had something to do with it. And I show in my book, Fast Food Genocide, pulling the data that color of your skin has nothing to do with it. It's what food you're being fed. It's social deprivation and food deprivation. And every American deserves the right to achieve the American dream and it pursue their education and have their mental faculties be intact and not lose brain cells as they get older and be able to be happy. And, and these foods, where they, they destroy your brain function and they make it so you can't be happy and can't have human achievement and can't have a healthy life. And the same bad foods are fed to Caucasian populations. You have the same bad outcome. It has nothing to do with genetics. After the, civil, the black Americans were freed after the Civil War and they were fed better back then, there were more centenarians among the black population than there were against the southern, the southern Caucasian population. Nothing to do with the color of your skin. And these fast foods have carcinogens. When you roast, when you fry meat, when you barbecue it, when you grill it, when you flame broil it, when you put it on a fast food grill, you cause N nitrous amino compounds and polyacyclic hydrocarbons and heterocyclic amines, and you get, you get toxic waste products in your food. And the World Health Organization has considered these fried foods and processed foods a class one carcinogen in the same category 
as cigarette smoking and asbestos. They consider processed meats and red meats a class one carcinogen, right? The brain is under attack, and what I'm saying to you, that even moderate consumption of these foods, even two servings of commercial baked goods a week is linked to major depression. 51% increase risk of depression in people who eating commercial baked goods like white bread, like a bagel, and a cookie or a piece of pizza just two times a week. How many of you have white something white flour products two times a week? Raise your hand. What a bunch of liars. <laughs> sorry, sorry. All right, I'm okay. I'll accept that. It was a joke. Jokes are good for you, even if I'm wrong. In other words, what I'm saying right now is smiling and laughing makes you live longer. We know that, right? And here's the thing. The joke doesn't have to be funny. You just got to smile and laugh anyway. Still makes you live longer. But here's the point I'm making on this slide. You see what it says in gray at the top? It says two servings a week doubles the risk of depression, and it goes up from there in a dose-dependent manner. What I'm telling you now, that processed foods, fried foods, and commercial baked goods and fast foods cause mental illness. And one in five Americans today are mentally ill. It used to be one in a hundred. Now it's one in five. And who's talking about these people and these kids with violence and anger and all the problems with depression? Who's talking about food as being the primary causative factor destroying people's brains? Who's talking about that you're losing brain cells with a surge of fast food and fried oils and sugars going to your brain? Oh, thank you. Episetic high glucose from sugar and honey and maple syrup and other sweeteners damages brain cells associated with brain shrinkage and Alzheimer's disease. The brain has a continual need for antioxidants and phytochemicals from colorful plants. And when you get demented at age 70, you didn't just suddenly get demented. You didn't suddenly have a good brain function and then a year later you're demented. No, you, you lost brain function for 30 years. You were struggling at work. You're losing your creativity. You're losing your memory. And then finally it gets worse and worse gradually. It didn't just cause it 75 years old. From the age of 45 on, you had, you, your brain wasn't functioning well. You follow what I'm saying right now? Our American population doesn't have normal brains anymore. It's not just when they get demented. They don't have normal brains even the years before they get demented. And it happens in childhood because you have school performance. Already been determined that children eating fast food and sweets and processed foods aren't as intelligent. They don't perform well in school. They can't become educated and have a successful life, and they're not as happy. They have brain fog, they have more depression, they have more sadness, and they have the lack of ability to deal with the stresses and, and, cre and creatively solve them in their lives. Tension deficits. What I'm saying right now is fresh fruits to some fresh fruit and vegetable consumption in childhood and infancy is associated with intelligence. Fast food lowers IQ, increases risk of autism in their children of the people who ate it, and it's linked to illegal drug use and crime. Let me say this one more time, just to make this clear, that the link between candy and junk food and later life drug abuse and crime is better in the scientific literature than the link between poverty and crime, lack of parents and crime, social deprivation and crime, being an orphanage, living in an orphanage and, and later life crime. The most solid link is the consumption of junk food and later life drug abuse or criminal behavior. Did you get that? Yeah. And there's what we have, right? That's how people feed their children. I know you're applauding for my great artistry there. We're talking here about the glycemic load of food being negative. And the word glycemic load has to do with how much sugar enters the bloodstream over that first hour after the food is eaten. In other words, the more rapidly the glucose enters the bloodstream, the more insulin is spiked up. Because what I'm telling you now, I'm starting to go into the second principle of a nutritarian diet, the second principle that radically extends human lifespan. What was that first principle again? Right, right, okay, you got that, right? Somebody said, right? And the second principle we're talking about a diet has to be hormonally favorable. Has to, can't spike up estrogen or insulin or IGF-1 or hormones that shorten lifespan. The first principle has to do with nutrient density, but the second principle has to be hormonally favorable. When you eat a diet with a high glycemic load in it, you spike up insulin too high. And insulin is a hormone, it's a fat storage hormone. It tells the body to put on more fat. 
It's pro-angiogenesis. Angiogenesis means the growth of blood vessels, new blood vessels, to fuel the growth of fat and to fuel the growth of cancers. Insulin is a hormone that promotes cellular replication, and, in, and it, that means replicating fat cells, but also promoting the growth of cancer cells simultaneously. When you're overweight, you're insulin resistant, so now when you eat that mango, you produce a higher amount of insulin. There's no such thing as a healthy, overweight person. You can't be overweight and healthy at the same time, because extra fat on the body blocks the uptake of insulin. Extra fat on the body produces excess estrogen, increasing the risk of cancer, breast, both breast and prostate cancer. Of breast or prostate cancer. You really probably can't get breast and prostate cancer. That was really a stupid joke, but... So what I'm saying to you right now is there are various carbohydrates you could choose to, to eat, but if you... But some are very, come into the bloodstream very rapidly, white, like white flour, like a marshmallow, like white rice, right? Or things that are white. I always say, the whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead, right? I always say, don't trust things that are too white, like cocaine, cigarettes, white bread, sugar, right? You know, okay. We're talking here about fast food versus slow food. An example of, the, we're talking about how fast the calories enter the bloodstream. Because oil enters the bloodstream very rapidly. You get a lot of concentrated calories into the bloodstream. Walnut oil, for example, will enter the bloodstream within five minutes. They say from the lips to the hips. In your bloodstream, stored as fat within five to ten minutes. Whereas if you eat the walnut, the sterols and stanols in the walnut, of course the walnut has a third the calories in it compared to the oil, a tablespoon of Walnut oil compared to a tablespoon of walnuts, one-third the calories. But here's the thing with the walnuts. The sterols and stanols and fibers bind fat so strongly that all the fat doesn't come into the body. The fat that comes in comes in very slowly over a three- or four-hour period, only about one calorie per minute. There's no spike in fat storage hormones. There's no signal of dopamine to the brain like a food addiction. The flood of calories into the brain from sugar or oil spikes dopamine release in the brain. You get addicted to that food. You want to keep eating because the calories enter the bloodstream so rapidly. When you eat the walnut versus the walnut oil, the calories come into the bloodstream so slowly. There's no central nervous system stimulation. There's no addictive drives. But here's the kicker. The fat magnet is so powerful that all the fats aren't able to come into the bloodstream and eat the whole walnut. It sucks out some of those calories into the toilet bowl. All the calories in nuts and seeds aren't biologically accessible to the body. So your brain got the signal you took in 100 calories. You stopped eating and you felt like you're satisfied like you ate the 100 calories, but then you only wound up absorbing 75 calories because the fat magnet sucked the calories out into the toilet bowl. But not only that, these sterols and stanols attract fat. They have a better affinity for saturated fat and cholesterol, so they're so powerfully attractive to fat that they suck the bad fat out of the bloodstream into the digestive tract and out into the toilet. So now your toilet bowl has more cholesterol and saturated fat, allowing the good monounsaturates and polyunsaturates to come in, allowing the bad stuff to come out, so it actually lowered your LDL cholesterol and removed oxidized LDL and lowered the storage of saturated fat on your body because you ate the, nut and se the whole nut and seed versus the oil. So whether it's... You take any nutritional scientist, legitimate nutritional scientist in the world, not commercially affiliated with a food manufacturing company, and you ask them, what's healthier, sesame oil or sesame seeds, olive oil or the olive, coconut oil or the full coconut, um, walnuts or pecans or the pecan oil, you ask any legitimate nutritional scientist in the world, get up here and let them try to argue that the processed food is healthier than the whole natural food the way nature designed it, and they're, if they say that they're an idiot. They all agree that the whole food has so many different beneficial factors that have a completely different biological effect than the processing and taking the oil out of that food and consuming it without the fiber. Are you following me now, right now? And did you recognize one important concept when I said moderate caloric restriction? That it doesn't take a lot of effort to do it? Because we eat foods that make you feel like you ate all those calories, but you really didn't consume all those calories, so it makes you wind up undershooting your caloric need for the day by a little bit. You understand this a little better right now? There's other foods that do the same thing because all their calories are not biologically accessible. I know I'm talking very fast because I want to get a lot in in the 90 minutes I have. 
but I'm, I'm slowing down when I need to slow down to emphasize a point, and I think you can get it when I'm going fast. When I, can, I think you can get it when I'm speeding up, and I, when I have to, I slow it down. Got it? If I'm going too fast, you could always yell at me. Okay, so an example here is oil and white flour, example of fast food, an example of slow food might be beans and nuts because they come into the bloodstream, because you eat that piece of white bread, came in at 20 calories per minute. You ate that bean with the highest amount of slowly digestible starch, releasing its carbohydrate very slowly over many hours, coming in at one calorie per minute. Not only that, but beans are the food with the most resistant starch. That means all their calories are not biologically accessible to the body. They're resistant to enzymatic degradation, so those calories pass through you into the toilet bowl. Let's go over that a little bit, okay? We're going to go over that a little bit later, about how beans make you feel like you ate 200 calories, but you didn't get them all in, because they're not all digestible and absorbable. We're going to talk about that in more detail. But when you eat foods with lack of nutrients, when you eat the fast foods, the foods that are digested rapidly, then you build up toxic metabolites like free radicals, especially advanced glycation end products. When the diabetic gets blind due to macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy, it's because the buildup of advanced glycation end products age their tissues faster. When they get kidney failure, it's because of the buildup of, the, of advanced glycation end products, and they get nerve damage in their leg or gastroparesis, they can't eat digest food, or they get their legs cut off because they can't feel their feet anymore. It's because of the buildup of toxic wastes accelerate aging and cause damage to your brain, to your liver, to your kidney, to your nerves, and to your eyeballs. See, there are two types of food addiction. The first is the flood of calories into the bloodstream, which makes you feel high, which gives you a strong, pleasurable feeling when you eat those concentrated calories, that ice cream, that cheesecake, that, fr that fried donut, whatever you're eating, with all those concentrated calories. It gives that dopamine surge. It's the same dopamine surge as if you had snorted cocaine or taken an opiate. But then, when you try to stop eating those foods, you try to get off them and not eat them, when you're no longer digesting the food anymore, the body can detoxify and try to remove the toxins when you're no longer in the feeding state and you feel shaky and weak and anxiety and you feel discomfort. Every addiction has a high and a low. It's painful to stop, but the pain occurs when your body's trying to rid itself of the toxin. The discomfort is the good part. It's the body trying to save itself from the damage. You can see, because there's two phases of the digestive cycle. There's the anabolic phase, which is while you're digesting the food. That's when the calories are coming into the body. When the body is breaking down, absorbing calories, and storing them away for utilization, it can't effectively detoxify and repair itself. The body doesn't effectively heal and repair tissue and remove toxins while you're eating and digesting. That's called the anabolic phase. It's in the catabolic phase when digestion has finished. Now your body is utilizing the stored calories for energy. And now it's breaking down the body tissues, removing toxins for excretion. It's actually deconjugating fatty acids and removing and making fat, to, fatty toxins water soluble so the kidney can excrete them and having to deal with and eat up free radicals. In other words, your body is most effectively living longer and healing the more time you spend in the, di the non-digesting state. The less frequently you eat, the longer you live. I always tell people, the longer you live in the catabolic phase, the longer you live. Should I say that again? Could you say it, please? The longer you live in the catabolic phase, the longer you live. People whose diet are toxic is toxic and is not healthy. They can't not eat food all the time because they're always detoxifying. They're feeling shaky and weak and headachy and stomach cramping and f mental fog and a growling stomach and esophageal spasm and they're moody. They can't stand the way they feel when they're not eating food. They gotta keep putting food in every few hours otherwise they don't feel well because their body is so toxic they can't tolerate not digesting food anymore. You have to be healthy to, be t to be feel great when you're not eating. See, real hunger, see the, the glucose curve goes up while you're digesting, and then it goes bound to baseline. But most Americans 
are so sickly that the minute the body stops, de- stops eating and digesting and detoxification is enhanced, then they start to feel ill. And they think that ill feeling is hunger. They think the headache and the shakes and the stomach cramping are hunger. It's not hunger. They just finished eating and digesting their meal. They didn't burn off all the calories that were eaten. It's like driving your car, filling your car with gasoline, driving it around the driving around one mile, coming back to the gas station and putting it up, filling it up with gasoline again. Of course, the gas will go out onto the pavement, but with your body, you can keep eating. But people, just to feel okay, they got to keep eating all the time. They don't like the way they feel when they're not digesting food. You have to be healthy and relatively non-toxic so when you enter the catabolic phase, you feel nothing and you can continue not eating until you burnt off all the calories that were stored. And then if the glucose curve starts to drop, which it's not going to, but then as you get to the end of your catabolic phase where you've burned off all your glycogen, then the body gives you true hunger. True hunger is a precise computer telling you the exact amount of calories to eat and not to maintain your lean body mass and maintain your muscle mass and bone mass. Hunger will never direct a person to become overweight. You can't become overweight unless you've eaten outside of the demands of true hunger. Did you follow that? There's no obese squirrels running around in the woods and obese deer and obese, you know, there's no such thing as obesity in the natural world. You have to go to New York City in the park and watch the squirrels eating the french fries. We can discombobulate their, their instinctual caloric driver, but eating hazelnuts in the woods, they're not going to overeat. There's no such thing as overweight, obese humans in human history before we had fast food and processed foods and we started to process oil and sugar out of food. It's impossible to eat that many calories. Eating, you can't even put that many calories in the one liter you have a stomach. What I'm telling you now, I'm not going to go into the detail, the, the science of all this that de- that, that right now because I want to have enough time to get through all this. What I'm telling you right now is most Americans go from one anabolic phase into another. They keep the digestive tract busy all day And this is probably one of the most important factors that shortens lifespan, is frequent eating. And I know you've been told by your trainers and advisors that you want to keep snacking and eating all day long to keep your metabolic rate high, or something like that. But that's the perfect formula for shortening your life. You should be eating when hungry. You shouldn't be eating for emotional needs. You shouldn't be eating for addictive drives. You should be eating when there's a biological need for calories. And true hunger is felt in your mouth and throat. It's accompanied by dramatic heightened taste sensation, and it makes food taste great. So I'm in my office in the afternoon, and somebody brings in to me a bowl of, delicious bowl of some soup they made. They said, Joel, you've got to try this soup. It's the best soup I ever made. It's blah, 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 blah. And I'll say, I'd love to try it, but not right now. I'm not hungry. If you don't mind, I'll put it aside for a while, and I'll get hungry. I'll eat it later when I'm hungry. And I'll enjoy it more when I'm hungry. I already told you this slide, right? We told you that. But the point I'm making right now is that these fast foods and processed foods make people into an overeating machine that can't be controlled. You can't control, it's almost impossible for a person to be at an ideal weight if they're putting unhealthy foods in their body. You can't willy-nilly cut back on calories. The drive to overeat is too intense and too uncomfortable. You can only eat the right amount of calories if you improve the nutritional quality of your diet because that will naturally decrease your appetite and make you feel satisfied with less calories. You getting that? Don't forget, I'm gonna get to that. I'm gonna get to the story about beans more in a little bit. But first I want to talk about the other hormone that's important besides insulin and estrogen is IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, because it's shaped like the insulin molecule. It binds to the insulin receptor. It promotes angiogenesis like insulin does. And cancer cells can't replicate and grow without angiogenesis promoting hormones allowing that. Cancer cells secrete angiogenesis promoters to allow, to tell the blood vessels to grow into them so they can get the nourishment and oxygen so they can grow and replicate and kill you. Fat cells are like cancer cells because they also secrete angiogenesis promoters that help maintain their life. Without angiogenesis promoting, fat cells would shrivel up and die. They can't maintain their growth and you can't swell out the body unless new blood vessels are also growing to get oxygen and nourishment to those fat cells. And IGF-1 is an angiogenesis promoting hormone that helps the growth of fat and helps the growth 
of cancer. So lower levels of IGF-1 are linked to reduced oxidative damage, insulin sensitivity, so your body produces less insulin, needs less insulin production, and it slows aging of the body and the brain. Lower levels extend lifespan. So now you're thinking, well, what foods promote IGF-1? Here's a study that shows that low levels, as levels go up, breast cancer rates increase. This is accepted by almost all nutritional scientists the world over. And sure, sugar does raise IGF-1 somewhat, but what raises IGF-1 the most is animal protein, high biological protein. If we look at food and IGF-1, we see that animal products, because of their high protein content, raise it, and dairy products raise it even more. And at high protein plant foods like greens and beans and nuts do not raise IGF-1. Now, why? because beans are about 30% protein, the same as a burger at McDonald's, how come a bean wouldn't raise IGF-1? Broccoli is 40% protein, more than a, much more than a burger. Nuts and seeds, some of them are pretty high in protein, like hemp seeds and sunflower seeds, very high in protein. Why are these high-protein plant foods do not raise IGF-1 like the high-protein animal pro, um, foods do? How come? One person said fiber, one person said nutrient dense. No, that's not the reason why. It's because that the animal products have a higher biological value. It means all their amino acids are at, are at higher levels, so they flood the bloodstream with high biological protein very rapidly. When you take in plant proteins, the plant proteins are not all biologically complete. So over a period of hours, they're made complete by the body so it can make its hormones. It'll make the proteins complete by breaking down some of the bacteria that live in the gut to get the balance of amino acids it needs, or by breaking down the epithelial cells that line the gut. We slough skin and hair off all the time. Little skin cells slough off, but our digestive tract, because of acids and digestive enzymes, we're actually self-digesting and sloughing off epithelial cells that line the villi all the time. So you're really all meat eaters, whether you're on a vegan diet or whatever you're eating, you're still eating some meat that's your body, because you're eating part of your own body, part of the meat that's you. What I'm saying to you right now is for the body to produce enough IGF-1, it can complete the proteins as it needs to complete them by just breaking down some more bacteria in your gut to absorb this protein or to some of the stored amino acids in the villi or lining into the, into the, digestive, in the digestive lining. Letting the body have the proteins become biologically complete over many hours in a steady state. They come complete little by little over a three-hour period, keeping your IGF-1 level flat. When you take in egg whites, and let's say fish or white meat chicken, or you're taking the dairy products, it doesn't work that way because you flood the body with huge amounts of biological protein all at once, and the body can't keep the IGF-1 at a steady state low level. It pumps it up really high, and those high levels of IGF-1 drive angiogenesis, drive cellular replication, and drive cancer. You following this now? It's like fast food, right? One commonality between every cancer is all cancers are associated with, M with high mTOR signaling. The one most consistent feature of every cancer is high mTOR activity. And what increases mTOR activity? High protein, high glycemic, extra calories, and eating all the time. What reduces it? Protein restriction, animal protein restriction, low glycemic exposure, reducing the sugar, honey, maple syrup, reduced calories, extending the catabolic phase, or intermittent fasting. That means that a recent study showed took women who had breast cancer and followed them for 10 years. Those that finished dinner at an earlier time had a 13-hour window from the end of dinner to the start of breakfast reduced the risk of dying by 27% over that 10-year period. I think I said that wrong. I think they reduced their risk of death by 36%. I'm sorry, not 27%. Reduce the risk of, and their diet wasn't any different than the other, the same calories, same foods. They just ate earlier dinner. They just had more time at night where they weren't digesting food. You follow what I'm saying now? So we give some studies more credence compared to other studies. Why would I give one study more credence 
where another study could be right. It's a hypothesis, doesn't really tell me the answer. How do I get the right answers here? How do you know who to trust what they're telling you? I'll tell you right now, it's not that difficult. The study has to have thousands of people. It has to go on for decades, not a year or two. And it has to look at hard endpoints like death or cancer, not whether you lost weight or, you had tri or your triglycerides went down. I can give you Twinkies. You'll be so sick of eating Twinkies, you might reduce your calories down. On the Twinkie diet, you might lose weight and your cholesterol will look better. Maybe you're, that doesn't mean you're not going to die 20 years early on the Twinkie diet just because you lost weight on the Twinkie diet. These short-term studies can be manipulated to show anything. Long-term studies are very difficult to, to manipulate. Let's look at one of these long-term studies that followed 6,000 people over an 18-year period, and the people with a higher intake of protein in their diet, with a higher intake of animal product, had a four-fold increased risk of death over that 18-year period. Those with, in the lower third of animal protein consumption had, of course, didn't have much cancer, and there was a 75% increase in overall deaths comparing the highest third to the lowest third. How much protein were they eating in the high third group? They were eating an average of 30% of calories from protein a day, same as the Americans eat. Compare that to some of these paleo advocates telling people to eat 50 to 70% of calories from animal products. Over and above what already is proven to cause death in that one study, every single study that's tested long-term populations on higher protein intake has showed accelerated cancer and accelerated heart disease. I'll show you a few more of those studies. There's no studies that showed increased longevity from higher consumption of animal products. It always shows shortening of life. That paleo message is irresponsible, and the people advocating it should be put in jail. They're killing people. I should come up here and arrest some of these people right off the stage, wrestle them down to the ground, and put them in cuffs. Look, breast cancer, if we look, go back to 1965, we find populations with one-hundredth the amount of breast cancer as in America. We've got to go back many years because we've exported American way of life, so these populations that were eating a lot of vegetables and not much oil and sugar now have Kentucky Fried Chicken and McCancer in every block. And the countries with the highest rates of breast cancer are the countries with the most dairy product intake because the, mo because the food most associated with high rates of breast cancer are dairy products. The foods most associated with lower rates of cancer and lower rates of heart disease are always green vegetables, especially raw vegetables. I'll ask you a question right now. What food is the most powerful association with wiping out and preventing dementia? What food is the most strongly protective against dementia of all foods? The answer is dark, leafy, green vegetables. That's the answer. Let me ask you another question. What's the food most associated with clean blood vessels with no atherosclerosis, preventing heart attacks and strokes, most more powerful than any other food? What is the answer? Green leafy vegetables, green vegetables. One more question. Right, green leafy vegetables. That's right, you got it. <laughs> you're getting it. Okay, you're getting it. I can go on then. And how can, you, how can you take that dial and shorten your lifespan most effectively? Turn down your age, you're gonna die, you know, lower your age? Eat more empty calories. And what's the easiest way to pour calories all over your food really fast? You don't even suspect you're doing it? You put oil on your food. The consumption of oil has increased a thousand fold in the last hundred years. Soybean oil a thousand times. All high omega-6 oils. See, when you take your fat from nuts and seeds, it comes into the body so slowly, you burn the calories for energy. You don't feel hungry. Your body utilizes it for activity at one calorie a minute coming in. When you take an oil at, 100, at 20 to 30 calories a minute coming in, you're not going to burn that for energy. It has to be stored as fat. Once it's stored as fat, it's not coming off the fat so quickly. It doesn't burn. You don't burn fat until you're out of the, until you're like, until the end of the catabolic phase when you start to burn fat. Most people eat again before they get to the point where fat burning was efficiently started to occur. What I'm saying right now is it's bad enough you're eating oil, but when you eat overheated oil and foods cooked in oil, now even the fumes are carcinogenic. 
People who work in fast food restaurants, just inhaling the fumes off the fryers, have higher rates of cancer. I don't know if they eat the food in the fast food restaurant. Just working there increases the risk of cancer. Whereas nuts as your source of fat, because I'm not advocating a low-fat diet, I'm saying switch your fats from oils to the real natural food that the oil came from. You understand what I'm saying, right? Because when you do that, here's an analysis, a meta-analysis, looking at every study, looking at the issues, showing that one serving a day of nuts and seeds reduced risk of cardiovascular death in more than 350,000 individuals, more than 44,000 deaths, reduced heart disease mortality by about 40%. What food could do that? Incredible. Look at the Prevamid study, where they compared olive oil to the nut to eating a nut. Sure, when they showed, compared the consumption of butter to olive oil, what do you think happened? More olive oil, cardiovascular deaths went down by 15% compared to eating butter as a source of fat. Olive oil is only 14% saturated fat, much lower in saturated fat than butter. But in any case, it's much better to eat oil than butter. But that doesn't make oil a health food because deaths went down by, compare, by people compared olive oil to butter. Because what if the study looked at olive oil compared to eating nuts. The study did look at that, and you know what it found? Heart attack weights dropped by another 60%. Did you get that? You don't buy a car by comparing it to a junkyard wreck. I can, show a, I can make a study show you anything I want. I can show you that eggs make you live longer by taking out sweets from the diet and putting eggs in, because eggs aren't as bad as eating sweets. Pull out cookies and donuts, put more eggs in the place, it makes eggs look good. It doesn't make egg, eggs are not good because they're better than a donut. Compare an egg to a bean, and then you'll see that the lifespan was increased by 10 years or more from the bean versus the egg. You've got to compare one food again. It has to be a real test. Because the foods, the foods with the most powerful link in the scientific literature to prevent cancer are G-bombs. That means it's an acronym easy for you to remember. That's greens and beans and onions and mushrooms and berries and seeds. Take flax seeds, for, it, for example. Flax seeds or chia seeds. How many of you eat some flax seeds or chia seeds every day? Most of you raised your hand. Because why wouldn't you? Studies shown on women with breast cancer already have breast cancer. Once they have breast cancer, the effects are now, moderate, are now lowered. But 71% decreased risk of death from putting lignans in their diet over that 10-year period. It blocks estrogen stimulation from the breast. And why wouldn't you eat mushrooms every day? We put together a, a nutritarian diet, puts together a dietary portfolio of all those individual foods with the most protection against cancer, and you eat all those foods in the diet on a regular basis, and it works synergistically to prevent cancer. We can win the war on cancer right in America right now. We have the science, we have the ability. I'm president of the Nutritional Research Foundation. We have a nutritarian research office at Northern Arizona University. We're conducting a study on thousands of women eating a nutritarian dietary portfolio with all these anti-cancer foods showing that women can reverse early stage breast cancer and they can prevent breast cancer from occurring through the portfolio. Utilizing these foods. Every one of these foods individually show dramatic protection against cancer. Let's look at beans for an example. Because I told you earlier that beans are the food with the most resistant starch. That means all their calories are resistant to enzymatic degradation. When you eat beans regularly, because they're resistant to enzymatic degradation, bacteria has to digest the starch, has to ferment it. And when bacteria act on the resistant starch in beans, they turn that resistant starch into short-chain fatty acids. The starch is turned into fat, predominantly a fat called butyrate. Butyrate has anti-diabetic effects and anti-inflammatory effects that make you live longer and make you thinner. Let me say this one more time. Be very clear about this. That when the can of bean, or the, the bean says 200 calories, a 200 calories a cup, you feel like you're eating 200 calories. It occupies the space in your stomach. Your brain gets the signal from the fiber and the nutrients that you ate 200 calories. But all those calories are not biologically accessible. You're not going to take in 200 calories. Because when the body converts the resistant starches into fat, it happens so far down in the digestive tract 
in the distal portion of the small intestines and proximal portion of the large intestines, so far down there that 90% of the calories pass through into the toilet bowl. Remember I told you earlier nuts increase stool fat? Well, now I'm telling you beans also increase the fat in your stool. And these inflammatory fats, anti-inflammatory fats, bathe your colon, preventing colon cancer. And if there's one food, one food with most, associ most associated with people living to be 100 years old, the one food that's common to all centenarians and in all populations of the blue zones around the world, proven to extend lifespan, it's the consumption of beans. It's okay to have some crazy hypothesis to want to look different, but the question is, does the science support that hypothesis? There's a lot of irresponsible, nonsensical advice being promoted by people and dangerous advice being promoted by people. So look at this, for example, here, that what, what carbohydrate food has more fiber than any other food? Beans. What food has more resistant starch? Beans. Which carbohydrate has the most nutrient density, the most anti-cancer nutrients? Beans. There's no dangerous lectins or agglutinins in beans. They're burned off with cooking. You can only cause damage in the studies from raw bean powders, from for people that ate the beans raw and sprinkled them on food. The cooking of the beans removes the agglutinins, removes the lectins that are dangerous. There's no dangerous lectins in cooked beans. That's falsifying data to suggest that. The small amount of lectins, the most dangerous lectin, and more, more people are sensitive to wheat lectins, such as gluten and bean lectins. That's very rare that people are, have an intolerance to digestive allergy to bean gluten. Bean lectins, very rare. The lectins in beans actually have been shown to have anti-cancer effects and strengthen bones as well. But here's the thing. What do the long-term studies show? What do the studies show on people eating beans regularly? Well, here's a study, the Nurses' Health Study, following 70,000 women for decades following those that just had beans twice a week had a 24% low risk of breast cancer. You would think that if beans were bad, there would be one study, just one, that showed some decreased heart endpoint, like cancer or death or lower lifespan for people eating beans. But every single study ever studied in the history of nutritional science, so the inclusion of beans in the diet reduces cancer, reduces diabetes, reduces heart disease, and extends human life. No question, no contest. No need to ask me further questions about it. It's just nonsense if you think beans are hurting you. It's true that there are people with certain conditions that are allergic to certain foods. Some people can't eat, you know, eggs. Certain people can't eat wheat. Some people can't eat beans. Some people can't eat sunflower, can't eat peanuts or sunflower seeds. But those are individual either allergic or food intolerances that are not applicable to the general population. Anybody trying to make this applicable to the general population if beans have some harmful effect is a phony, a fake, and lying to you. Am I being clear enough? Oh, okay. Okay. More greens, more beans, more nuts and seeds, lower the glycemic load of your diet and reduce um, diabetic and cardiovascular polymers. Remember I told you when I first started this presentation, at the very beginning, I said the only thing ever been proven to extend life is moderate caloric restriction and an environment of nutritional excellence. Remember I told you that? Well, when you eat greens, beans, and nuts, it makes you feel full, and all their calories don't get absorbed into the bloodstream. So when you're eating a diet with these natural plants, because of the fibers, and because I've discussed with you today that all their calories are not biologically accessible, that part of the bean calories are lost into the stool as fat, and part of the nut calories are lost into the stool. So you eat as much food as you feel like eating, but you're naturally not taking in the calories you thought you took in. You're moderately caloric restricting because you're using more beans instead of bread and oils and meats and cheeses and processed foods and potatoes and rice. You shouldn't be eating brown rice anyway because brown rice is in this country is contaminated with arsenic from the chicken manure because of the arsenic they feed the chickens. But the point I'm making right now is that we're not going around starving ourselves to moderately caloric restrict. We're just eating the right foods to the amount of, amount of foods we feel like eating and we're making delicious recipes, making them taste fantastic, and we're eating the amount of calories we require and desire, but it moderately caloric restricts us. Naturally. You following this? And sure, some nights I'll just have a glass of vegetable juice. I'll try to go to bed a little hungry a couple nights a week as a means of extending lifespan further because we know that if we 
extend that catabolic window and, and, and eat. And you don't want to go to bed on, an, on a full stomach. You want to go to bed on an empty stomach. But some nights I purposely go to sleep a little drop hungry just to slow the aging process, slow my metabolic rate a little bit down. So these are irrefutable facts. They're, they're not controversial. They're accepted by the World Health Organization and, all, and the vast majority of nutritional scientists. There's no controversies. I don't want to leave you with any confusion at the end of this conference that vegetables, beans, seeds, nuts, fresh fruits and berries, especially G-bombs, are great for you. They extend human lifespan. Excessive amounts of animal products cause disease like cancer. And refined carbohydrates don't just cause obesity and diabetes, they also cause cancer. These are not in contention. Now, once your diet is restricting animal products significantly, like a vegan-type diet or a flexitarian diet, reading a little bit to very little bit of animal products or none, then the main thing to be, the main important thing is not just to be, have adequate B12, but you also have to have adequate DHA for the brain to prevent brain shrinkage with aging. It's already been shown that people whose omega-3 index is below 4, like 3.5 or 3, can have significant brain shrinkage with aging if they'd be DHA deficient all through life. And once the brain shrinks, you're not, it's not coming back again. You can't grow a new brain. A lot of vegans and a lot of nutritional gurus advocating a vegan diet are also being irresponsible with not taking care with their clients and their people they advise to make sure they're careful not to become DHA deficient. Because there's a lot of different abilities of the ability to convert ALA from walnuts and green vegetables and flax seeds into DEPA and DHA. In other words, they'll say, oh, but if you eat enough flax seed or flaxseed oil and you don't you restrict omega-6 fats, you'll produce enough, will produce enough DHA naturally in the body itself. But that's not true. Some people it's true for. There's a huge wide genetic differences between the ability to convert ALA into DHA. And we can't leave a certain percent of our population getting demented or depressed and just ignoring them because of your bias based on your predetermined agenda or your philosophy. This is not a philosophy. This is not a belief system. This is about taking care with people's lives and giving them information that's solid and conservative and not taking chances with their potential for achieving a healthy lifespan and a healthy life expectancy right to the age of 100. We know that DHA deficiency can increase brain shrinkage and increase risk of depression. And a study on 166 vegans showed that about 27% were significantly deficient. The majority were insufficient, but borderline insufficient, but, the, but, a, but a big percent, like 30%, were really deficient, caused potential for damage. Just want to make that clear. So a nutritarian diet is vegetable-based, not grain-based, right? Not like a standard diet. Lots of fruits and beans and seeds and nuts, not lots of dairy and meat. We get our most of our protein from green vegetables and, and, and root vegetables and beans and seeds and all types of fresh foods. All, all, almost all natural foods are high in protein. Almost all plants are high in protein. Even grains are high in protein. And oil is used not at all or very sparingly because then you're pouring empty calories over your food. You, you can't consume oil and, not, and very likely not be overweight. Maybe if you worked eight hours a day behind a heavy plow all day long, you can have a little oil in your food. But how many of you work eight hours a day doing manual labor? Most of you sitting on your desks all day with computers. You can't throw 300 calories a day of oil on top of your diet expecting you to burn that off. It's impossible. It's the opposite of a nutritarian diet. A nutritarian diet means, means eats more calorically dense foods, more low-calorie foods. And natural foods, the ones you would pick right from the tree or right from the ground. I, I forage in the woods behind my house. And I find scallions and mushrooms that are edible and green vegetables, and I find parsley in the woods, and I find all these foods you can eat, and pine nuts are all over the place. If you lived in a natural environment, you were shipwrecked on a desert island eating natural foods in the jungle in the woods, you'd find food to eat, but you'd have to work to get that food. And the human stomach is only a liter. It mostly fills up with 400 calories. It starts to feel full. It's very hard to become overweight if you're eating natural foods. It's almost impossible to become overweight if you're physically active and you're eating natural foods. I've studied this for years, and I finally figured out, through the years of study and contemplation, that Skipper never really lived on that island. (Laughter) 
I'm glad you guys are old enough to get that. <laughs> and animal products have to be reduced significantly, or you can go vegan. Has to, you can't eat significant animal products and expect not to, slow the, not to pay the price in reducing your lifespan. Lots of mechanisms, not just IGF-1, but also when you eat a diet higher in animal products, you produce a different type of bacteria in the gut. And the bacteria in the gut from a lot of animal protein produce trimethylamine oxide in the liver, which causes inflammation of the interior endothelium of your blood vessels, accelerating atherosclerosis and strokes, and weakening the lining of your blood vessels, predisposing you to stroke and hemorrhage and death and being in a nursing home. And the IGF-1 decreases insulin resistance. No. The IGF-1 increases insulin resistance. So now when you eat a carbohydrate like rice or potato, you have a higher spike in glucose and it's making you more diabetic. It's the combination between the high glycemic carbohydrate and the animal product that accelerates cancer, accelerates obesity, and accelerates death the most. Macaroni and cheese, pizza, white bread and meat in the between, like a burger or roast beef sandwich, you know, spaghetti and meatballs. The American diet couldn't be better designed to kill people had it been designed by ISIS. We're talking here that a nutrient a nutritarian diet is nutrient dense. We avoid high calorie, low nutrient foods as much as possible. Right? Now here's a study on a nutritarian diet. 443 people in the study following it for six months. It dropped their systolic blood pressure 26 points. More than any other drug, more than drug can do in any other diet study, it doesn't even come close. The closest dietary study to the one on a nutritarian diet lowering blood pressure was the DASH, low salt DASH diet, which lowered systolic blood pressure 11 points. Here a nutritarian diet dropped blood pressure 26 points. You see, when you eat a diet with so many phytochemicals and antioxidants, it protects your brain, it keeps your body fit for your whole life. It's not just living longer, it's not just pushing 100, it's also fully living, being fully alive the years you are living. Do you follow what I just said? It means having your full mental and physical faculties, you can enjoy your life to the most. The average American is just cutting their life short. They have a poor, healthy life expectancy. Their life is losing quality even before they die, and they have a lot of suffering and tragedies going on in their life. And the, and the medical profession and medical care keeps them under the gun of fear. Testing, taking drugs with side effects, worry about cancer. It's like being under a totalitarian ruler. Like being in, it's like being in a prison if you're a conventional American. And your doctors or your wardens putting you in your jail of a hospital and torturing you in that hospital, putting tubes in the orifices of your body. And they can't just die peacefully at home around your family and your loved ones, they got to whisk you off to the hospital and torture you for a few days, and then you can die if they took a few hundred thousand dollars out of your bank account. <laughs> Most Americans die penniless. Why do they die penniless? Medical. It all goes to the medical profession in the last months of their life. It's insanity. Let me give you a few cases of some of patients of mine and some people who follow a nutritarian diet to show you what happens when people who are sickly follow a nutritarian diet. Here's a couple of cases. Here's Pam, who came to me in 1997 with four liters of fluid in her lung from ovarian cancer, given six months to live. A real person. She's in great health today. This is like 21 years later. She has no cancer. You think that's something likely to do with her lifestyle and diet? Or was it just luck? I'm just one doctor, I'm not an oncologist. I don't see that many patients, that many cancer patients. Look at Lee. She had breast cancer metastatic to the bones in 1995, given six months to live. Her bone scan cleared, no more cancer. And I'm not claiming here, certainly want to make it clear, that I'm not saying advanced cancers are predictably and routinely reversed with the nutritarian diet and my anti-cancer protocol. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying the fact that even these advanced cancers were reversed is tremendously powerful, shows tremendous power and protection, especially because with early stage cancers like DCIS or early stage prostate cancer, we see reversal in a very predictable fashion. And that means if you don't have cancer, you can protect yourself from getting it. We can stop cancer, we can win the war on cancer right now. 
And it's your job, it's your job, not just my job, it's your job to get this message out too, right? We're all in this together. Here's Tom facing a foot amputation from diabetic retinopathy. Within six months, he's saved his leg, his diabetes is gone. No longer high blood pressure, no more cholesterol and drugs. There's Emily and her mother. It's not her mother, that's her one year before. She lost 120 pounds, look how much younger she looks. People are aging backwards. They're getting their health back. Look at Scott. He lost about 300 pounds, 320 pounds in one year. He wasn't trying to lose weight. He was trying to save his life, right? Saved his life. He was happy when he got to 182 pounds. He didn't know that. He wasn't trying to lose more, but he dropped another 10 pounds just because he still, his body gravitated towards the healthy weight. He wasn't on a diet. Same thing with all these people. Teresa went from 227 to 125 in one year, her LDL cholesterol dropped. He had heart disease. Heart disease, look how much younger she looks. Got rid of her chest pain, got her blood pressure back to normal, got her off the statin drugs, and no more disease. Look at him, here's a guy who's older. He came, was my patient in 1994 at age 72, he had triple vessel disease. He had atherosclerosis, his cardiologist told him he needed an angioplasty in an urgent manner. I begged with him, I said, John, just give me three months of your life. I hadn't written books by then. He didn't know he should trust me. I got him to follow the program for three months before he went back to the cardiologist. And in three months, the cardiologist repeated the stress test and said, I can't believe it. I've never seen this ever happen before, but your, disease, your, cardi your heart disease is reversing itself. But that's not the story. I have thousands of patients that reverse their disease. By the way, he's the guy on the right. <laughs> it's not the story. I have hundreds of people like this in my practice who reversed their heart disease. Didn't, have an, didn't need angioplasty. He never needed angioplasty. He's in his mid-90s today. Now he's 96 years. Now he's 97 years old with no heart disease. Can't even get these patients to die. <laughs> but the point I'm making, the point I'm making is his blood pressure on three medications was pretty, was pretty high. Over the years, when his medications came down over the first six months and removed for the next 20 years, his blood pressure kept getting lower as he followed the diet longer. The point I'm making is it's not aging that causes heart disease and high blood pressure. It's the day in and day out of eating the wrong foods. When we eat the right foods, things go away as you get older. Predictably. Look at Steve and Tara. See, it says 226. She rate 226. He rate 447. One year later, Tara lost 80 pounds. Steve lost 220 pounds in one year. 220 pounds in one year. It's not a typo. Their daughter, Chloe, lost 32 pounds and got rid of her asthma. He got rid of his sleep apnea, his diabetes, his heart disease. She got rid of her allergies, her psoriasis, her skin disease. Right. You know who's really thrilled about this? Really, really thrilled about this? The dog. He's finally got some room to sit in the car. You can take advantage of modern nutritional science. It's not that confusing. It's not that controversial. There shouldn't be a lot of people telling you different messages. This is very straightforward and clear. And I want to just, before I finish, I want to address this one last myth that people are thinking to themselves or saying that, sure, you'll live longer and you'll age slower, but you won't enjoy your life as much and I'd rather just live a little few years shorter and eat what I want and enjoy my life more. Because that's not true. That's an addict talking. Because addict, when you're an ad addicted to these processed foods and these highly concentrated calories, it takes over part of your brain and you're looking for irrational and delusional thoughts to maintain your addiction. And let me tell you something. When you improve your health, you improve your taste and your smell as well. And natural foods taste better than they did before when you were sick and overweight. And... When you learn the delicious recipes that are available, I've spent like 30 years of not just preparing recipes myself, but spreading this message, getting the contribution of recipes from world-class chefs all over the world. Actually, people contribute recipes to me, and they, we, in the, on the drfurman.com member center, people rate the recipes. The point I'm making is we make this diet the most delicious diet you ever can eat. And people, when, they're, when we actually just study on it, with more than 700 people in a medical study published in 2010. The name of the study was The Changing Perceptions of Hunger on a High Nutrient Density Diet, published in Nutrition Journal 2010. 
When we published that study, we showed that these participants, after six months, enjoyed the flavor and taste and enjoyment of their diet more than their, just as much or more than their old diet. You're not giving up pleasure in life. You're enhancing your pleasure with eating as well. And I eat whatever I feel like eating. I eat whatever I want to eat for pleasure. But the foods I choose to eat for pleasure are the foods that are the healthiest foods in the world because those are the foods I enjoy the most. You follow what I'm saying right now? I'm not suffering. I don't have to have any willpower. I eat what I feel like eating. And I like feeling great because I ate that food. And I like intellectually knowing I'm going to be okay, knowing that I'm eating the foods that are best for me. Because you get that, you feel good about yourself for doing it. You have your full intellectual powers and, that are there and your full physical powers working as well. But you also are emotionally protected. And you're living without fear of being sick, without need for doctoring. I'm saying to you, you don't need all these health professionals, not the alternative medicine doctor, not all, you know, not all these, you, you, you should be your own health professional. Your health is in your own hands. You can't buy health in a bottle. You're responsible to take care of yourself. So my most recent book is Fast Food Genocide. It's a real fascinating book. I think that you'll find that people who read it will find it extremely interesting. Like a lot of people tell me they can't put it down. Anybody here read Fast Food Genocide? A few people. Wow, only a few people. What are you guys, living in Mars or something? <laughs> but I, I do have, I've written 11 books. I have six New York Times best-selling books. I have some of them are here. But I, of course, have the end of diabetes, the end of heart disease, the end of dieting. The end of dieting talks about food addiction and emotional overeating and all the factors which drive people to yo-yo that wait up and down their whole life. I have cookbooks and, of course, super immunity about cancer. But the point I'm making right now is that I will stop. I will, I'm never going to stop. And I will do anything to help you remove the obstacles so you can achieve superior health. I want to make sure people know they have the right to superior health, and if they choose to, they don't have to have what happens to other Americans happen to them. So I'll leave you with that. I have about eight minutes left. I can take some questions and answers. Let's do it. Thank you. Check out my website at drfurman.com. I have lots of information and recipes and a lot of um, things to take, remove the obstacles towards achieving optimal health. Yes, the front row. That's correct. Raw, raw, what you just said raw, is true? Raw bean sprouts. Right, I'm going to repeat that. that. This gentleman said the lectins and beans are not a problem because they're well cooked. We soak beans for 24 hours or for 12 or 24 hours, and then we cook them. The thick lentils don't, you know, the lectins cooked out within 15 minutes. But the hard beans, like red kidney beans and the real, the, and the black beans, take, you know, best to cook them for an hour to cook out all the lectins. Sprouting also removes lectins. That's true as well. So the only way you can be hurt by beans is eating them unsprouted and raw. Everything else is just, and the, the little remaining lectins that are there, the microscopic amounts that are hardly detectable, have beneficial health effects to help prevent cancer and strengthen bone mass. Not an issue. Yes. There's no question, Dr. Furman, I absolutely agree with you. Food is critically important, but there are other factors that you're not bringing into the picture. I only with you 90 minutes. That's exactly right. And perhaps if I can get a hold of you and uh, enlighten you in some of the other factors that are so critical, such as your family history and such as parents who come from, uh, shall we say, downtard, downtrod uh, uh, countries, and they hold it right there. Okay. Here's what I'm saying. I don't need you to tell me to teach me this. I'm trying to teach you this. The American population has a broad bell-shaped curve where the average person dies at 78. For every one who lives to 98, 20 years more, one person dies 20 years less. For every person who lives 10 years more, one dies 10 years less. We have a wide bell. A nutritarian diet obliterates genetics. It pushes the bell narrow. So the people with the bad genetics live to be 95, and the people with the good genetics live to be 105. What I'm saying to you is it's a bunch of, the people saying it's all about genetics are over-exaggerating it. They're saying that because people are eating bad, allowing the genetic weaknesses to be expressed. Genetics play a relatively low role in this, and I thought you were going to say there are other factors besides nutrition, meaning 
kindness, social relationships, exercise, and of course, people, if they're unhealthy and overweight, they can't exercise. People who eat a healthy diet and feel great, their exercise becomes automatically part of their life. They enjoy it, and they want to stay active. So I, so I want to stop this idea that genetics determine our future. It's not true. Very That's few it. diseases determine that. Yes. IGF-1. This, I heard you say IGF-1. It does soy produce. Um, processed and isolated soy protein does increase IGF-1 because the proteins are concentrated, but soy beans in their natural state does not increase IGF-1 unfavorably. Now keep in mind that as we go over the age of 85, the ability to assimilate and digest protein goes down. Especially if you've been on a lot of meats your whole life, you, you start to be able to so that your IGF-1 could drop too low in your late, as you get older, which also could be a risk factor. But a nutritarian diet with the inclusion of beans and nuts and seeds and green vegetables is naturally high in protein, is an appropriate diet, even the vegan form for growing children or the elderly, whereas many other vegan diets that are carbohydrate best, eating mostly rice and potato or macrobiotic diets, would be too low in protein for people at the, extents of at the ends of life, early in life and late in life. So yes, isolated soy protein and fake soy products are not advocated, but natural soy like edamame and tempeh would be. Uh, thank you. I, You're I, I appreciate what you said um, about the, the likelihood that vegans, pure vegans, may need to supplement with omega threes. I'm wondering if, if there are any other recommendations you would have supplement wise, and in particular, I'm wondering about vitamin D. Correct. But what all Americans, whether they're vegan or not, are usually deficient in vitamin D. So I do recommend, even so you don't, so in other words, even if you're non-vegan, you're still going to be deficient in vitamin D if you're not living out in the sun without clothing enough in a, in a warmer climate. So yes, the nutrients that are moderately low on a vegan diet that are better off to supplement are vitamin D, iodine, if you're not using seaweed or seafood, K2, which is not on a vegan diet, which helps, um, which have beneficial effects for bone mass strengthening, zinc, which can be deficient from phytates combine zinc in the, and as you get older, zinc needs could, zinc absorption could decrease, and a little bit of zinc can decrease risk of pneumonia and infectious disease by improving immune system. B12 and DHA. What about magnesium? You know, this is a nutritarian diet is very, very high in magnesium. You wouldn't need that. And also the beans are high in med lead medium and magnesium, so that wouldn't be an issue at all. Plants also plenty high in calcium as well. Okay, question right here. I could see a person right over there with their hand up. We have two minutes left. Uh, can you please expand in the fat for the pregnant? This is what I see the attack in my practice on the pregnant woman, that they need to eat a high protein diet, otherwise the child is not going to grow well. Please, can you demystify that? I'm Further. sorry, but I, I'm not sure I heard the whole question. Am I saying that you were told or you think that if the child, when they're young, don't have a high protein diet, they're not going to grow well? Well, right? no, 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 no. The pregnant woman. Pregnant woman, right. Uh, they go to the doctors and they tell them right. that they, if they not eat 175 grams of proteins a day or more, the child is not going to be healthy. And this is, goes on and on and on. I see it in my practice with all the pregnant women that come to really? me for nutritional advice. Well, don't forget, I'm a, I'm a physician. And I teach nutrition at medical schools and to, at scientific conferences to medical doctors. I've never heard that. I've never heard any doctor advocating 175 grams of protein a day for pregnant women. That's a, dangerously, that's a dangerously high amount of protein. We don't advise professional athletes to eat that much protein. So that's like a, it's a, it sounds pretty ridiculous to me. But however, let me just say this, that, that this drive to eat protein to maximize growth has been one of the major factors accelerating the explosion of cancer in the last 100 years in America. Make this clear, that the faster the animal grows, the faster they take to reach maturity, the, the shorter the lifespan, and the higher cancer rate they get. We can, we can check a woman's risk of breast cancer by seeing when she went through puberty. If we're going to feed the pregnant mother in the early, all, all this protein, her child's going to grow much more rapidly, go through puberty at a younger age, and be at higher risk of breast cancer later down the road. I'm saying to you, that's the formula for premature death. And it's sad that we're doing the opposite, and some people are still back in the dark ages with, with, with these myths and incorrect information. My three daughters, in their 20s, went through puberty at between 16 and 19 years old, all three of them. And the average age of puberty in 1850 worldwide was 17 years old. And the link between lower, risk, lower age of puberty and breast cancer is solid and more estrogen exposure through life. We're not supposed to develop breasts and be menstrual periods at age 13 and 14 and 15 years old. 
It's unnatural. That's the high-protein diet that's accelerating aging and growth. And who is the shortest lifespan of any job or any professional in life in North America? Who's the shortest-lived people? The power lifters and linebackers on football teams who got big and over, over 250 pounds. When they eat to get over 250 pounds, they die very young. So we know that it's not just fat, but also excess muscle shortens your life. So bad advice is bad advice because people are given bad advice doesn't mean anything except to call it bad advice. Okay, one last question. Has to, okay, way in the back there with you jumping up and down, right. Yeah. For um, leaky gut or to help your gut, what specific foods are better for that? Or is there another new su supplement before besides probiotic? Let me make this clear that when you take probiotics or even fermented foods, the vast majority of those bacteria pass through you into the toilet bowl. There are four foods that, not, that build the healthy bacteria the most, but when these four foods build the bacteria the most, they, these bacteria live there permanently. They adhere to the wall of the villi and form a biofilm. When you eat beans regularly, the bacteria that grow, that are necessary to digest the beans from the regular eating of them, Thicken the biofilm, prolonging the glycemic effect of everything you eat. That means when you had that mango for breakfast in the morning, the glycemic effect of that mango was reduced because you ate beans the day before. The regular consumption of beans lowered the glycemic effect of everything you ate. Scientists call that the second meal effect. It means that the food you're eating thickens the biofilm with healthy bacteria that become adherent to the villi, slowing the absorption of calories that you eat from any other foods, besides that food. And it's not just the second meal after that food it was eaten, it's anything you eat the third or the fourth meal because you regularly eat these four foods. The four foods with the most protection that thicken the biofilm and give you the best, most healthy microbiome that encourage weight loss and lower the glycemic effect of foods and prevent leaky gut are two raw foods, are raw green leafy vegetables, especially raw cruciferous vegetables like kale and collards and bok choy and cabbage, raw onion or scallion, and two cooked foods, the most powerful microbiome thickening foods, don't forget we have 10 times the cells in our digestive tract that we do in the cells in the whole rest of the body, are mushrooms cooked, because mushrooms contain a mild carcinogen called a garotene that blows off with a minute of cooking, and mushrooms protect the microbiome, and contain aromatase inhibitors and angiogenesis inhibitors, aromatase inhibitors like tamoxifen. You, naturally, the, the mushrooms have natural tamoxifen, natural aromatase inhibitors that are safe. They prevent breast stimulation from estrogen and lower estrogen production and prevent menopausal symptoms and, and cooked beans. Beans, greens, mushrooms, and onions. That's how you protect the microbiome. You know, I'm glad you answered that question. You asked that question, right? Because that's the secret not just to preventing leaky gut. It's the secret to a long life and being slim. And it's a secret to eat those foods because they reduce your caloric, you desire to ex eat excessive calories. Did you still have your hand up? Is there something wrong with your arm? Oh, there's somebody behind you. Oh, I, uh, uh. Okay. Uh, I was supposed it, to end. You want it, in terms of animal products, do you make a distinction between grass-fed, grass-finished uh, meat and factory-farmed meat? You know, these are really excellent questions. Thank you so much because it makes me really clarify some of these issues. And how many of these studies were done with factory farmed meat products? Excellent question. Let me allow me to answer that now, okay? Thank you. Thank you. All the studies showing animal products reduce lifespan, increase cardiovascular and cancer death were done on grass-fed naturally raised meats, not commercial raised meats. All of them. Because they're done in Europe and South America. And, and, Aust and Australia, and New Zealand, and Paraguay, and Uruguay, and we see whatever study we found. We, we import most of our grass-fed meat from Australia. Were they also grass-finished? I don't know. What I'm saying to you is that they, were, they had grass their whole life. They were they pasture-raised meat. I don't know finished versus not finished, because finished, I think, means they could be eaten grains. The point I'm making, it doesn't matter whether the food is organic or not organic or grass-fed or, or or weed fed, or, or whether you gave them corn or weed, or whether you gave them pasta or bagels or, or croissants. It's not the issue. The issue is the high protein. It's true that the commercial raised meats have more dioxin and PCBs. It's true that they have a better, more omega 6 and less omega 3s, but it's not the main issue. 
Watching the type of meats you eat is not going to save your life. You're still going to die of cancer if you eat a high meat diet. It's not going to protect you. It's and not the answer. how much is a high meat diet? Okay. I, what is a good serving on your zero to three a week? We want... It's, that's a difficult question, but here's the answer. Is that all blue zones have populations that eat less than 10% of calories from animal products. When we want to see cardiovascular reversal, you always see... To, Predictable reversal, you have to be at zero to five percent level. That means for a man, for a woman, usually less than seven to eight ounces a week. For a man, less than nine to ten ounces a week of animal product. So we're talking here about the American population eating more than more than more animal products, triple that, even in one day. You know what I mean? So we're talking about a major reduction in animal products from. Um, an average of 30 to 35 percent to zero to five percent. Now, in the 10 or 15 percent range of animal products, then genetics play a big role because some people do okay with 10 percent and some people don't. But when you go above 30 percent, everybody in America gets sick. And when you go below five percent, you see almost nobody developing cancer or heart disease if their diet is otherwise mostly plants. Does that help you with that? Thank you, everybody. Hope you got a lot out of this. Dr. Joel Furman, please give it up for Dr. Joel Furman author of Fast Food Genocide. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs>